Today I thought we'd quickly build a little synthesizer in High so you can see the kind of things I get up to. This project won't require any scripting and we're going to use all of the stock components of High's. Well, we're not going to use all of them, but all the components we use will be stock components of High's. So there's no external resources that will be required. We've got a fresh project here and I think we'll add a container first of all. Let's add a container. So I'm just going over here, I'm clicking the pencil icon and this is unlocking the module tree. Another view for this, if we click on the top module, which I've called Synth Demo, if we click on that, this is a, another view of the same module tree. So we have all the same things here. But usually you'll find yourself working over in this uh, little sidebar version. So we're going to add a container, and a container just contains other modules. It's just an organizational tool, really, but you can also use it for routing different channels to different places as well. And inside our container, I think we'll add a waveform generator. So all I'm doing to add these modules is I'm clicking the plus button, and it means we're adding something into the container. So we're going to add a waveform generator. So let's click on the waveform generator so we can see what that looks like. And if I play some notes on my keyboard, we'll hear it. So the waveform generator is going to be the heart of our synth. And it allows us to mix two waveforms together. So if we see here on the left, we've got a saw wave. And if on the right, we can put a sine wave, we can use this mix knob in the middle to morph between the two. So we'll keep the saw on the left and we'll keep the sign on the right, uh, but we'll shift the sine wave up an octave. So we'll just adjust the octave knob there. Should we go two octaves? No, let's stick with one octave higher. So we can close this. If we go back over to our module tree, we'll see that Highs has by default added a default envelope to the gain modulation. So I'll open the wave generator, waveform generator, so we can see this tree in a larger view. So if we go to the gain modulation section, so that's the same as this section over here, gain modulation, gain modulation, we can see we've got a simple envelope here added by default. But let's remove this, we'll click the X, or we could click the trash can over here. And we'll add, we'll go down to envelopes, and we'll add a full AHDSR envelope. So again, to do this, I'm just clicking this plus button here. That's the same as clicking the plus button over here. So we'll click there, envelopes, A H D S R. Let's also add an LFO to modulate the pitch. So we can do that over here. Uh, we'll click there and we'll go to time variant and we'll select LFO modulator. So we'll open up our LFO, which is in the pitch section here. So this is the LFO we just added. So by default, this is a bipolar oscillator. If we click this little double arrow here, it now becomes unipolar. And we can control the maximum pitch offset with this slider here. Let's set that to half a semitone. Uh, let's set it to one semitone, actually. We'll just put one in there. And we can sort of see that oscillator going back and forth. I'll just turn this up so we can see that more. So you can see that's what's happening. So it's following a sine wave, but we can change that if we wanted to. We'll stick with the sine wave though, I think. Set that back to one semitone. And let's add a submodulator to the intensity section. And we're going to add a time variant MIDI controller. So this is for CC modulation. And using the default value knob, we can control the amount of the LFO. Again, I'm just going to increase this so we can see it moving there. And as I pull this down, we can see how this knob affects it. And also because this is set to CC1 currently, if I move my mod wheel on my keyboard, so you can't see me doing this, but I'm moving the mod wheel there and you can see the value changing. So we can also use the mod wheel if we wanted, but I want this to be controlled from the UI. and I don't want the user to do it directly from a CC here. So what I like to do is I'll set this to a CC that's never used like 94. So now if I move my mod wheel, nothing's happening. And later on, we're going to connect up a knob on our user interface to the default value knob. 
and then the user can assign that to the mod wheel if they want to. So this gives us kind of a dedicated control just for the intensity of this LFO and has a range of 0 to 127. Okay, and we'll set this back to one semitone. There we go. So in our container, we're going to add a send container. So you can think of a send container like a send bus. You can load effects into here and send them from elsewhere. But it's important that the send container is after the place you want to send them from. So we're going to be sending them from our waveform generator. So we've placed the send container after the waveform generator. And we're going to add a send effect. We'll just add a reverb in here, I think. Just a simple, simple reverb. So this is an algorithmic reverb. Okay, now if I play on the keyboard, we're not going to hear anything yet. And, oh, um... Oh, our envelope's vanished. I must have accidentally deleted it when I was moving all the things around. Let's just re-add the art envelope back there. Okay, so yeah, we won't hear anything yet other than the standard waveform generator because we're not yet sending the signal to our send effect. So to do that, we'll go up to the effect section of our waveform generator. So we're in our waveform generator and we go down to the effect section, we'll click the plus, we're going to select send effect. And now we tell it which send effect we want it to go to, or which send container, sorry. And if you have multiple effects in your send container, you can use this channel control to select which effect the send is going to. And if you need more than eight effects, you can add additional send containers. So we'll set that to zero. So it's going to the first effect, which is the simple reverb. And the gain is the um, send level. So now if I play, I pull this down. And again, we'll link this to a control on the user interface when we get to that stage. So that's it for the back end stuff. Now we're going to start uh, building our interface. And as I said, we're not going to do any scripting. So although we've got a script here by default, we're not going to be entering anything into here. But we can turn off this uh, edit thing here. And you can see it says interface there. So that's our default script. And you can see it's highlighted green. So if I click on that, it's not going to do anything. But if we weren't in the interface script, it would open this scripting view here. So I'm just going to click this button to minimize the script editor because we don't need that. We're going to focus on the interface design here. And we'll zoom in a bit there. OK, we're going to start by adding an AHDSR graph. So we right click, we go down to floating tile. And I can make this a little larger. Maybe something like uh, like that. And over here where it says content type, we're going to select AHDSR graph. And then if we look in this little data column, in fact, let's make that a little larger. So we've got this data property here and where it says processor ID, we're going to put the name of our, our envelope. So I'm going to click on it. I'm going to click on the name. I'm going to right click and select copy. You could also use the shortcut key, control C. And I'm going to paste it over here inside the quotation marks and I'll hit apply. And there's our envelope display. And if we move the knobs over here, we can see it moves the knobs on our, dis uh, moves the graph view on our UI. We can customize this further. Um, over here, we've got the component list. If we click this drop down, we can now see our floating tile. So we can customize these properties. So we can see the background color. Let's turn the opacity up there. Uh, we can select the fill color. Let's go for a red. This looks like um, it's just called item color two, but I think this is the outline. Let's see, we'll set it to green. Yes, yeah, so that's the outline. And not sure what this one is. Let's find out. So I think if I play on the keyboard, no, we don't, that doesn't do anything. And this one, does this do anything? Okay, so these last two aren't used. But if we were scripting this, oh, that's done something. Not that I want that. If we were scripting this, we could um, use these colors in our script to design the ADSR in a, in a sort of more customized way, not just having these um, fixed properties. Now I'm going to have to open the script editor occasionally to hit this compile button so it refreshes what we're doing over here. 
Okay, so there's our HDSR graph. And next we should add some knobs so that the user can control what this uh, what the shape of this graph is. So the user's only ever going to see this front interface. They won't access any of this stuff. So we'll add some, um, they're called sliders, but they can be used as sliders or knobs. In this case, they're, by default, they're knobs. But if we come over here where it says style, we can change them to horizontal or vertical sliders or range sliders. But we'll just leave them as knobs for now. So let's have a look. The mode is set to linear, but this is for attack. So we need it set to time. And I'm going to change the name of it to KNB attack. And over here where it says the text, we'll just change that to say attack. And let's set the default value to not point. Um, no, let's set, let's set it to two, two milliseconds. Okay, while I've got this knob selected, I'm gonna press control D and that will duplicate it. And I'm going to press Ctrl D again. And I'm going to press Ctrl D again. So that will give us the ADSR. We won't bother with the H. And we'll just rename these. So this is um, currently called KNB Attack 1. So we'll just rename that KNB um, Decay. That's the one. And I hit Enter there so it closes the property editor. Let's just change the text as well. We can also rename them over here in the component list. We can just select the component, hit F2, and you can rename them in this little window. That'll be the sustain. And that's the release. And then we just need to change the text over here. And the sustain, that isn't time-based, that's decibels, so we need to change the mode to decibels. There we go, and I'm just going to open this and uh, press compile, just so it refreshes everything. There we go. Okay, the next thing we need to do is connect these knobs to the knobs here, because currently moving these knobs doesn't do anything. So over in the component list, I'm going to click on the first one, hold shift on my keyboard and click on the last one, so they're all selected. Then from this processor ID drop down, I'm going to select AHDSR envelope 1. Now I'm going to click on the KNB attack just by itself, and you can see it's held onto that value, AHDSR envelope 1. And in parameter ID, I'm going to select attack. So this is linking this knob to this processor, which is our envelope, and this parameter of the processor. If you need to link a knob to multiple parameters, you might need to do it through scripting, depending on what you want to do. But there is a way to do it without scripting, which is slightly more limited, and I'll show you that in a little while. Okay, so we'll do the same for the decay and the sustain and the release. You'll notice in this parameter drop down there are a lot more parameters than the ones we're using, so feel free to explore those. Okay, we'll open the script, hit compile, and that's taken on the values of our knobs, so let's just shift these. There we go. And so now we can set this to where we want it. We should set some sensible default values. So for the decay, uh, well, let's see what the defaults are for the actual envelopes. If we double click each one of these controls, it will set them to their defaults. So we can see that the attack is 20 milliseconds by default. We've set ours to two. The decay is 300. The sustain is zero decibels and the release is 20. I don't like the release being 20. We'll change that. But the decay 300, let's set that then 300. So this is the default value property. Sustain was zero. And this in decibels, I'm actually going to set it to minus one. And for the release, let's have a default release of 500. Okay, so now when we double click our controls, it will go to those defaults. Oh, did that one not take? Yeah, 500. Oh, maybe I have to hit compile first. There we go. Okay, so now we can control the envelope from our UI. Now we didn't give a good name for our HDSR graph, so let's just click on the floating tile over here, hit, hit F2, and I'm going to call it FLT, so that prefix is short for floating tile, AHDSR. So I always try and give my components names that make some kind of sense, and 
if I'm using these in the script, I can just glance at them and know what they are. If I saw Kane be attack in the script, I know it's a knob and I know the control is controlling attack. If I just called it attack, I might not know if it's a knob or a button, for example, or some other type of control like a, a drop down menu. So by calling it can be attack, when I see it in the script, I know exactly what it is. Okay, the next thing we need is an on-screen keyboard so we can see what we're doing. There is one built into highs, by the way. If you click this little button up here, you can see um, an on-screen keyboard. You can see the CPU usage and a few other bits, but we're going to add one to our interface. So we're going to click the pencil to unlock the interface designer. We're going to right click. And if you're on one of the newer MacBooks, um, right click doesn't work. You have to, I think it's, you, you tap with two fingers or something on the trackpad, something like that. And it'll pop up this menu. We click add new floating tile. From the content type, we're going to select keyboard. And now we can resize this to uh, fit our UI. In fact, what I'm going to do over here where it says component size, I'm going to drag the X all the way to the left, the Y all the way to the bottom, and the width, I'm going to make it the full width. When you get into scripting, you can completely customize this and make a totally unique keyboard, but we're just going to stick with the stock one for now. Over here, we have these data properties. I'm going to set the lowest key to 24. So that's the lowest key that's displayed. So now if I press key 24 on my keyboard, it should uh, trigger this key down here. Yeah, okay, so that works. And then middle C is there. Let's add a knob to control the mix between the saw wave and the sine wave. So we'll add a knob and... Oh, now this is interesting. I had the floating tile for the keyboard selected, so it's put the knob inside the keyboard. So can you see that over here? We've got a little drop down and the knob is actually, here it is down there. It's living inside the keyboard. So you can um, stack components in this way. Um, it can be quite useful for some stuff, but in our case, we don't want that. So I'm just going to click on the knob here and just drag it up there. So now it's outside of the keyboard. And now let's just move these, there it is. So this will control the mix between the sine, uh, between the saw wave and the sine wave. So we'll call this KNB mix. Give it the text of mix. And we want to change the mode to I think it's normalized percentage is what we want. Uh, let's test that. So we'll um, set the processor ID to waveform generator and the parameter ID to mix. And then we'll hit compile. And now let's see if that works. So we'll open our waveform generator over here. And oh, I've still got editing enabled. I need to turn that off. There we go. So yeah, there we are. So a normalized percentage, which is what we've set this knob to, means the knob is actually outputting the values between zero and one. So if you were to access this knob in the script, you'd see a value between zero and one, but the output display is between zero and 100%. That's what it means when it says normalized percentage. It means the actual internal value is normalized to a range of zero to one. So that's our mix knob. Let's set the default value to 50. I'll just compile that. And let's add a knob to control the amount of pitch LFO. So it's going to control this default value knob. So we'll just, uh, oh, we need to rename this knob first, actually. I thought we had, but it didn't take for some reason. There we go, can be mix. So let's just duplicate this control, control D. And we'll rename this one KMB LFO. And oh, while I'm over here, I'll rename the keyboard FLT keyboard. And back to our LFO knob, we will change the text to be LFO. And we're going to change the range, uh, the mode, sorry, to linear and the range, so we've got the minimum and the maximum, we're going to set the maximum to 127. The step size is how much it moves every time you move the knob. So we're going to set it to one, so it goes zero, one, two, three, four, etc. The middle position can be 64, and I think the default value can be 64 as well. For the processor ID, we'll select our MIDI controller, 
And for the parameter ID, we'll select default value. And again, I'm going to hit compile. And now if we open our MIDI controller, moving this knob should move that one. There we go. Uh, let's add a button to turn our LFO on and off. So we'll right click, add a button. Call it BTN for button LFO. And in the processor ID, we shall select our LFO modulator. And in the parameter ID, we'll select enabled. So that means when the button's on, it will the LFO will be enabled. And when the button's off, it will be disabled. If you wanted it the other way around, then instead of selecting enabled, select bypass. And we'll change the text here. LFO on off. And we'll compile that. And let's test it. So if we click the LFO on, we can see the LFO over here is on because it's all highlighted. If I turn it off, you'll see it sort of grays out. There we go. On, off. Okay, now we should add a control for our reverb send amount. So this gain control here. So we'll add another knob. Call it KNB Reverb. If you had more controls for your reverb, you might want to call this Reverb Wet or Reverb Signal or something like that. But because we've only got the one, we'll just call it Reverb. And the text can be Reverb. The mode needs to be set to Decibels. The default value, let's put that as minus six. The processor ID, that's going to be our send effect. And the parameter ID is going to be Gain. And again, open up this, click Compile, and let's just test that. I need to turn off editing, there we go. So now we can control the gain of our reverb. Okay, the last thing we need is a preset browser so we can set these knobs how we want them and save it as a preset. So let's just um, move all of these up a little bit. So I've enabled editing, and I'm just going to drag a box around all of these controls and just shift them up. I'll move these ones up a bit as well. Okay, so now we'll add a preset browser. So I'm going to right click, add floating tile, and we'll make it about that big. And in this content type drop down, select preset browser. And there we have a preset browser. Now that bank one there, that's because I've created presets already in this particular project. But Usually you won't see that, and in fact, we'll delete it in a moment. And let's rename this floating tile. You can probably guess what I'm going to call it. FLT Preset Browser. Okay, now I just want to reorganize these controls a bit over here. I like to lay out my controls here, generally how they're laid out on the UI. Although sometimes you don't want to do that if you're dealing with them. Um, things that are on different levels of the Z axis, because that does make a difference here. But um, generally that's what I do. So I'm going to move my keyboard down below the preset browser. And the reverb is going to go up um, right to the top, in fact. And ADSR, mix, yeah, LFO, LFO. Yeah, that'll be all right. Right, so let's just hit compile again, make sure everything's up to date. Okay, so we've got a preset browser here. Let's just customize it a bit. So we don't need can you see this green band here? That's for adding notes to presets. We, we don't need that, so let's get rid of that. So we click on the preset browser, and then here we can edit the properties again. So can you see where it says show notes? We'll change that to false. And then we'll hit apply down here, and then that's gone. And there's plenty of other things in here you can customize, and uh, we can customize the colors, actually. Let's make it red like our ADSR. There we go. Something. Something like that. Okay, and once again, hit Compile. So if we click on this bank and we'll click Delete, we'll just get rid of that entirely. So any controls that you want to have saved in preset when a preset is created, you have to enable this button, Save in Preset. And when it's enabled, you'll see a little star over here in the component list. You see these little green stars? If I turn off Save in Preset, 
watch can be attack over here. You can see the star disappears. So that star means it will save in the preset if you create a preset. So if you don't want a control to be saved in the preset, turn that off. So we can add a bank, call it bank one. I think that's what it was called before as well. And then if we click on the bank, we can add a category. We'll be really creative and call it category one. And then in here, if we click add, we can add a preset. Guess what I'm going to call it? Preset one. Okay, now let's move all these controls around. And we'll add another preset. We're going to call it preset two. Okay, now if I click on preset one, it will load preset one. You'll see all the controls switch back. And then we can load preset two. And then preset one. So you can see it's a pretty straightforward system. So that's it, let's try it out. Um, we will add one more thing in a moment, but let's just try it out first of all. I'm going to set my mod wheel up to control the mix. So we'll right click on that and the user will be able to do this as well. And we'll set it to CC1. If you don't want the users to be able to do that, then you click on the mix knob or whichever knob you're interested in here. You scroll down to the bottom and you disable this option, enable MIDI learn. Just turn that off and then the user won't be able to do that. But we'll leave it on for now. So now if I move my mod wheel, it's controlling the mix and that's being forwarded to the waveform generator over here. So now I can smoothly glide between the two waveforms. And if I hold down my sustain pedal, that works by default. Right, let's add a couple more things just to finish this off. Uh, we should have a pitch wheel modulator. So in pitch modulation over here, we're going to click on there and we're going to go to dime variant and pitch wheel modulator. And let's close that. So now we have a pitch wheel modulator. And if you want to customize this, you can set the uh, yeah, this table so you can control the curve. So all I'm doing to control this is I'm right clicking and then dragging up and down. And you can add table points and do all sorts of interesting shapes. And you can set the range bit. We'll set it to two semitones. So now if I move my pitch wheel. And I think we're also hearing a bit of LFO in there as well. Yeah. Okay, so the last thing we're going to add is a delay. So there's a few places we could add this. We could add it as a send effect. We could add it to this container up here. We could add it to this container here, which is the master container. Or we could add it within the waveform generator itself. And I think in this case, we'll add it inside the waveform generator. If we had, say, uh, another waveform generator inside our container, or perhaps a sampler, or a sine wave generator, or some other sound generator inside our container and we wanted to apply this effect to everything in the container then we'd put the delay in the, at the container level but since we've only got the one waveform generator we'll just put the delay in the waveform generator's effects tree so there we go now we've got a delay now let's disable the tempo sync button so now it's just in milliseconds and you see we've got a delay for the left channel and a delay for the right channel but i think in our case it's going to be nice if these had the same value. So let me show you how we can add one knob on the UI and have it control both of these knobs. Now the main limitation to this is the knob on the UI has to have a range of 0 to 127. If you're scripting it, then you can make it have whatever range you want and you can make it display the same values here. But I'm trying to keep this simple and not use scripting, so we'll just go with the simple version. So we're going to right click and add a slider. We'll call it KNB Delay. We'll give it the text delay. 
we're going to set the range to 0 to 127. So this is like we did for our LFO knob there, and we're going to set the step size to 1, the middle position to 64, and the default value, that can be 64 as well. OK, now what we've been doing previously is we've been setting the processor ID. But if we do that, we can only set it, let's, let's do that for example, let's set it to, to the delay. Then we can choose either the left time, the left delay time, or the right delay time, but we can't choose both. So this won't work for us in this case. So we're just going to click this empty slot here to clear the processor ID. So what we're going to use instead is the macro system. So if I click on this button up here, you can see we get these knobs. They're all grayed out at the moment because we haven't made use of them yet. But these are macro knobs and we have eight of these and we can assign them to pretty much anything. So with our KNB delay here, if we come over to this section where it says macro control, we can choose one of those eight knobs. So we'll set it to macro one. Now if I open those macro controls again and move our delay control, you can see it's moving macro one. It's got a value range of zero to 127, which is why our knob needs to have that same range. And then we can open our delay. And if we click this little edit button next to the macro knob, we can now select which controls we want this macro knob to apply to. So if we click on left delay, you can see it gets a little green one. And right delay also gets a little green one. And now we can disable editing. And now if I move the delay control, you can see it moves those two knobs together. So that's a really simple way of connecting two knobs. Again, it's not ideal if you want to display the actual time range on your UI, but it's good for a quick little project like this. So let's um, try this out. So that seems to work. We've got a nice delay there. Let's just move that up to next to the reverb since that's kind of where it appears on the UI. And we'll hit compile. Okay, and then we'll just save this. Now I'm going to export this as a standalone application. I'm not going to go into the details of exporting because that's kind of a separate topic. But if you've set up highs and you've compiled it yourself, then it should be pretty much good to go for exporting. Uh, but basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to export, export as standalone, click OK, and it's popped up on my other screen with a little window. Let's bring that across. So it wants me to choose the format. I'm just going to select standalone and I'm on GNU Linux as you can see. So I'll hit OK and I'm going to click OK on this and it's going to open a file browser. So for me, being on GNU Linux, it's really easy for me to compile. I just open a terminal, drag this file onto it. and hit enter, and then I just wait for it. But if you're on Windows or Mac, you might have a few more steps. So I'll speed up this bit of the video because this will take a little while. Okay, I've canceled the build process because I've just remembered something important. Because we're doing this as a standalone, and it's not going to be a plugin that's running in a door, I need some way of telling it which MIDI input I want it to use. Um, because if you're running it in a DAW as a plugin, then the DAW will just forward your MIDI controller. But because I'm going to compile it as a standalone, I need to be able to tell it which input to use. So I'm going to right click, add a floating tile. And I think we can just squeeze it in here. And from the content type, I'm going to select MIDI sources. And this will just show my MIDI input devices. And we'll just rename this FLT MIDI sources. And again, we'll hit compile, save the project. Okay, now I'm going to export again. So I'm just going to go through that same process. And we'll run the build. Okay, so that finished compiling. Let's open up the builds folder. We'll go to builds. We'll go to Linux makefile. If you're on Mac, it'd be in here. And if you're on Windows, it would be in here. Go to Linux Makefile, Build, 
and there's our app. So if I open it up, it's open on the other screen. Let's bring that across. So there we go, standalone app. And we'll just um, we'll bypass the container in highs so that we're not hearing stuff in highs. And we'll just minimize that. Okay, so I can select my MIDI input here. Okay, so I'm just going to turn this delay down a bit. And we can see, by the way, our presets are still here. So I hope you found this video helpful and I hope it's given you something you can work with. I'll be posting the snippet for this project on my Patreon page for my higher tier patrons. So if you'd like access to this exact project that I've made, uh, do check out the Patreon link in the video description. I post new videos to Patreon every month and there's some exclusive content there and some exclusive videos that I don't make public anywhere else. So do check that out if you're interested in more content like this. Please click the like button and the subscribe button and share this video with anybody who you think might be interested in it. If you've got any questions or comments, leave them below the video and I'll get back to you. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.